Introduction to Sappho, 100 Lyrics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jacqueline Bangfort. Sappho, 100 Lyrics by Bliss Carmen. Introduction. Sappho, who broke off a fragment of her soul for us to guess at. Sappho, with that gloriole of ebon hair on calmed brows. O oh, poet woman, none foregoes the leap, attaining the repose. E.B. Browning. Introduction. The Poetry of Sappho. If all the poets and all the lovers of poetry should be asked to name the most precious of the priceless things which time has wrung in tribute from the triumphs of human genius, the answer which would rush to every tongue would be the lost poems of Sappho. These we know to have been jewels of a radiance so imperishable that the broken gleams of them still dazzle men's eyes, whether shining from the too small brilliance and the handful of stardust which alone remain to us, or reflected merely from the adoration of those poets of old time who were so fortunate as to witness their full glory. For about two thousand five hundred years, Sappho has held her place as not only the supreme poet of her sex, but the chief lyrist of all lyrists. Everyone who reads acknowledges her fame, concedes her supremacy, but to all, except poets and Hellenists, her name is a vague and uncomprehended splendor, rising secure above a persistent mist of misconception. In spite of all that is in these days being written about Sappho, it is perhaps not out of place now to inquire, in a few words, into the substance of this supremacy which towers so unassailably secure from what appear to be such shadowy foundations. First, we have the witness of her contemporaries. Sappho was at the height of her career about six centuries before Christ, at a period when lyric poetry was peculiarly esteemed and cultivated at the centers of Greek life. Among the Moloch peoples of the Isles in particular, it had been carried to a high pitch of perfection, and its forms had become the subject of assiduous study. Its technique was exact, complex, extremely elaborate, minutely regulated. Yet the essential fires of sincerity, spontaneity, imagination, and passion were flaming with undiminished heat behind the fixed forms and restricted measures. The very metropolis of this lyric realm was Mytilene of Lesbos, where, amid the myrtle groves and temples, the sunlit silver of the fountains, the hyacinth gardens by a soft blue sea, beauty and love in their young warmth, could fuse the most rigid forms to fluency. Here Sappho was the acknowledged queen of song, revered, studied, imitated, served, adored by a little court of attendants and disciples, loved and hymned by Alcaeus, and acclaimed by her fellow craftsmen throughout Greece as the wonder of her age. That all the tributes of her contemporaries show reverence not less for her personality than for her genius is sufficient answer to the calumnies with which the ribald jesters of that later period, the corrupt and shameless writers of Athenian comedy, strove to defile her fame. It is sufficient, also, to warrant our regarding the picturesque but scarcely dignified story of her vain pursuit of Phaon, and her frenzied leap from the cliff of Lucas as nothing more than a poetic myth, reminiscent, perhaps, of the myth of Aphrodite and Adonis, who is, indeed, called Phaon in some versions. The story is further discredited by the fact that we find no mention of it in Greek literature, even among those Attic comedians who would have clutched at it so eagerly and given it so gross a turn, till a date more than two hundred years after Sappho's death. It is a myth which has begotten some exquisite literature, both in prose and verse, from Ovid's famous epistle to Addison's gracious fantasy and some impassioned and imperishable dithyrams of Mr. Swinburne. But one need not accept the story as a fact in order to appreciate the beauties which flowered out from its colored unreality. The applause of contemporaries, however, is not always justified by the verdict of after times, and does not always secure an immortality of renown. The fame of Sappho has a more stable basis. Her work was in the world's possession for not far short of a thousand years, a thousand years of changing tastes, searching criticism, and familiar use. It had to endure the wear and tear of quotation, the commonizing touch of the school and the marketplace, and under this test its glory grew ever more and more conspicuous. Through those thousand years, poets and critics vied with one another in proclaiming her verse the one unmatched exemplar of lyric art. Such testimony, even though not a single fragment remained to us from which to judge her poetry for ourselves, might well convince us 
that the supremacy acknowledged by those who knew all the triumphs of the genius of old Greece was beyond the assault of any modern rival. We might safely accept the sustained judgment of a thousand years of Greece. Fortunately for us, however, two small but incomparable odes and a few scintillating fragments have survived, quoted, and handed down in the eulogies of critics and expositors. In these wisest minds, the greatest poets, and the most inspired teachers of modern days have found justification for the unanimous verdict of antiquity. The tributes of Addison, Tennyson, and others, the throbbing paraphrases and ecstatic interpretations of Swinburne, are too well known to call for special comment in this brief note. But the concise summing up of her genius by Mr. Watts Dunton in his remarkable essay on poetry is so convincing and illuminating that it seems to demand quotation here. Never before these songs were sung, and never since did the human soul, in the grip of a fiery passion, utter a cry like hers, and from the executive point of view, in directness, in lucidity, in that high, imperious verbal economy which only nature can teach the artist, she has no equal, and none worthy to take the place of second. The poems of Sappho, so mysteriously lost to us, seem to have consisted of at least nine books of odes, together with epithalamia, epigrams, elegies, and monodies. Of the several theories which have been advanced to account for their disappearance, the most plausible seems to be that which represents them as having been burned at Byzantium in the year 380 Anno Domini by command of Gregory Nazianzen, in order that his own poems might be studied in their stead and the morals of the people thereby improved. Of the efficacy of this act, no means of judging has come down to us. In recent years, there has arisen a great body of literature upon the subject of Sappho, most of it the abstruse work of scholars writing for scholars. But the gist of it all, together with the minutest surviving fragment of her verse, has been made available to the general reader in English by Mr. Henry T. Wharton, in whose altogether admirable little volume we find all that is known, and the most apposite of all that has been said up to the present day about, love's priestess, mad with pain and joy of song, song's priestess, mad with joy and pain of love. Perhaps the most perilous and the most alluring venture in the whole field of poetry is that which Mr. Carmen has undertaken in attempting to give us in English verse those lost poems of Sappho of which fragments have survived. The task is obviously not one of translation or of paraphrasing, but of imaginative and, at the same time, interpretive construction. It is as if a sculptor of today were to set himself, with reverence and trained craftsmanship, and studious familiarity with the spirit, technique, and atmosphere of his subject, to restore some statues of Polycletus or Praxiteles, of which he had but a broken arm, a foot, a knee, a finger upon which to build. Mr. Carmen's method, apparently, has been to imagine each lost lyric as discovered, and then to translate it, for the indefinable flavor of the translation is maintained throughout, though accompanied by the fluidity and freedom of purely original work. C. G. D. Roberts Now to please my little friend, I must make these notes of spring, with the soft southwest wind in them, and the marsh notes of the frogs. I must take a gold-bound pipe, and outmatch the bubbling call, from the beech woods in the sunlight, from the meadows in the rain. End of section one. Section 2 of Sappho, 100 Lyrics by Bliss Carmen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jacqueline Bankfort. 1. Cyprus, Paphos, or Panormus, may detain thee with their splendor of oblations on thine altars, O imperial Aphrodite. Yet do thou regard with pity for a nameless child of passion this small, unfrequented valley by the sea, O seaborn mother. 2. What shall we do, Cytheria? Lovely Adonis is dying. Ah, but we mourn him. Will he return when the autumn purples the earth, and the sunlight sleeps in the vineyard? Will he return when the winter huddles the sheep, and Orion goes to his hunting? Ah, but thy beauty, Adonis, with the soft spring and the south wind, love and desire. 
3. Power, Beauty, and Knowledge Pan, Aphrodite, or Hermes Whom shall we life-loving mortals serve and be happy? Lo now, your garlanded altars, are they not goodly with flowers? Have ye not honor and pleasure in lovely Lesbos? Will ye not therefore a little hearten, impel, and inspire one who adores with a favor threefold in wonder? 4. O Pan of the evergreen forest, protector of herds in the meadows, helper of men at their toiling, tillage and harvest and herding, how many times to frail mortals hast thou not hearkened? Now even I come before thee, with oil and honey and wheat bread, praying for strength and fulfillment of human longing, with purpose ever to keep thy great worship pure and undarkened. O Hermes, master of knowledge, measure and number and rhythm, worker of wonders and metal, molder of malleable music, so often the giver of secret learning to mortals, now even I, a fond woman, frail and of small understanding, yet with unslikable yearning, greatly desiring wisdom, come to the threshold of reason and the bright portals. And thou, sea-born Aphrodite, in whose beneficent keeping earth with her infinite beauty, color and fashion and fragrance glows like a flower with fervor where woods are vernal, touch with thy lips and enkindle this moon-white delicate body. Drench with the dew of enchantment this mortal one, that I also grow to the measure of beauty fleet, yet eternal. 5. O Aphrodite, God-born and deathless, break not my spirit with bitter anguish. Thou willful empress, I pray thee hither, as once aforetime, well thou didst hearken to my voice far off. Listen, and leaving thy father's golden house and yoked chariot, come, thy fleet sparrows beating the mid-air over the dark earth. Suddenly near me, smiling, immortal, thy bright regard asked what had befallen, why I had called thee, what my mad heart then most was desiring. What fair thing wouldst thou lure now to love thee? Who wrongs thee, Sappho? If now she flies thee, soon shall she follow. Scorning thy gifts now, soon be the giver, and a loth-loved one, soon be the lover. So even now, too, come, and release me from mordant love pain, and all my heart's will help me accomplish. 6. Peer of the gods he seems, who in thy presence sits and hears close to him thy silver speech tones and lovely laughter. Ah, but the heart flutters under my bosom when I behold thee even a moment. Utterance leaves me. My tongue is useless. A subtle fire runs through my body. My eyes are sightless and my ears ringing. I flush with fever and a strong trembling lays hold upon me. Paler than grass am I, half dead for madness. Yet must I, greatly daring, adore thee as the adventurous sailor makes seaward for the lost skyline and undiscovered fabulous islands, drawn by the lure of beauty and summer and the sea's secret. 7. The Cyprian came to thy cradle, when thou wast little and small, and said to the nurse who rocked thee, Fear not thou for the child, she shall be kindly favored, and fair and fashioned well, as befits the lesbian maidens, and those who are fated to love. Hermes came to thy cradle, resourceful, sagacious, serene, and said, The girl must have knowledge, to lend her freedom and poise, not will avail her beauty, if she have not wit beside. She shall be Hermes' daughter, passing wise in her day. Great Pan came to thy cradle, with calm of the deepest hills, and smiled. They have forgotten the various power of life. To kindle her shapely beauty and illumine her mind withal, I give to the little person the glowing and craving soul. 8. Aphrodite of the foam, who hast given all good gifts, and made Sappho at thy will love so greatly and so much, 
Ah, how comes it my frail heart is so fond of all things fair? I can never choose between Gorgo and Andromeda. 9. Nay, but always and forever, like the bending yellow grain, or quick water, in a channel, is the heart of man. Comes the unseen breath and power, like a great wind from the sea, and we bow before his coming, though we know not why. 10. Let there be garlands, Dika, around thy lovely hair, and supple sprays of blossom twined by thy soft hands. Whoso is crowned with flowers has favor with the gods, who have no kindly eyes for the ungarlanded. End of section two. Section three of Sappho, One Hundred Lyrics by Bliss Carman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eleven. When the Cretan maidens dancing up the full moon round some fair new altar trample the soft blossoms of fine grass, there is mirth among them. Aphrodite's children ask her benediction on their bridles in the summer night. Twelve. In a dream I spoke with the cypress born and said to her, Mother of beauty, mother of joy, why hast thou given to men this thing called love, like the ache of a wound in beauty's side, to burn and throb and be quelled for an hour, and never wholly depart? And the daughter of Cyprus said to me, Child of the earth, behold, all things are born and attain, but only as they desire. The sun that is strong, the gods that are wise, the loving heart, deeds and knowledge and beauty and joy, but before all else was desire. 13. Sleep thou in the bosom of the tender comrade, while the living water whispers in the well-run, and the oleanders glimmer in the moonlight. Soon, ah, soon the shy birds will be at their fluting, and the morning planet rise above the garden, for there is a measure set to all things mortal. 14. Hesperus, bringing together all that the morning star scattered, sheep to be folded in twilight, children for mothers to fondle, me too will bring to the dearest, tenderest breast in all Lesbos. 15. In the grey olive grove a small bird had built her nest and waited for the spring. But who could tell the happy thought that came to lodge beneath my scarlet tunic's fold? From the cool shade I hear the silver plash of the blown fountain at the garden's end. 16. In the apple boughs the coolness murmurs, and the grey leaves flicker where sleep wanders. In this garden, all the hot noon, I await thy fluttering footfall through the twilight. 17. Pale rose leaves have fallen in the fountain water, and soft reedy flute notes pierce the sultry quiet. But I wait and listen, till the trodden gravel tells me, all impatience, it is Faun's footstep. 18. The courtyard of a house is wide and cool and still when day departs. Only the rustle of leaves is there and running water. And then her mouth, more delicate than the frail wood anemone, brushes my cheek and deeper grow the purple shadows. 19. There is a medlar tree growing in front of my lover's house and there all day the wind makes a pleasant sound. And when the evening comes, we sit there together in the dusk, and watch the stars appear in the quiet blue. 20. I behold Arcturus going westward, down the crowded slope of night-dark azure, while the scorpion with red Antares trails along the sea-line to the southward. From the elex grove there comes soft laughter, my companions at their glad love-making, 
while that curly-headed boy from Naxos, with his jade flute, marks the purple quiet. End of section 3「Section 4 of Sappho, 100 Lyrics, by Bliss Carmen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 21. Softly the first step of twilight falls on the darkening dial. One by one kindle the lights of Mytilene. Noises are hushed in the courtyard. The busy day is departing. Children are called from their games herds from their grazing and from the deep shadowed angles comes the soft murmur of lovers then through the quiet of dusk bright sudden laughter from the hushed street through the portal where my lover will soon enter comes the pure strain of a flute tender with passion twenty two once you lay upon my bosom where the long blue silver moonlight walked the plain, with that pure passion all your own. Now the moon is gone, the play yard's gone, the dead of night is going, slips the hour, and on my bed I lie alone. 23. I loved the Attis in the long ago, when the great oleanders were in flower in the broad herded meadows full of sun and we would often at the fall of dusk wander together by the silver stream when the soft grass heads were all wet with dew and purple misted in the fading light and joy i knew and sorrow at thy voice and the superb magnificence of love the loneliness that saddens solitude and the sweet speech that makes it durable, the bitter longing and the keen desire, the sweet companionship through quiet days in the slow, ample beauty of the world, and the unutterable glad release within the temple of the holy night. Oh, Attis, how I loved thee long ago, in that fair perished summer by the sea. 24. I shall be ever maiden if thou be not my lover, and no man shall possess me henceforth and for ever. But thou alone shalt gather this fragile flower of beauty, to crush and keep the fragrance like a holy incense. Thou only shalt remember this love of mine, or hallow the coming years with gladness, calm and pride and passion. 25. It was summer when I found you in the meadow long ago, and the golden vetch was growing by the shore. Did we falter when love took us with a gust of great desire? Does the barley bid the wind wait in his course? 26. I recall thy white gown, cinctured with a linen belt, whereon violets were wrought, and scented with strange perfumes out of Egypt. And I know thy foot was covered with fair Lydian-broidered straps, and the petals from a rose-tree fell within the marble basin. 27. Lover, art thou of a surety not a learner of the wood-god? Has the madness of his music never touched thee? Ah, thou dear and godlike mortal, if Pan takes thee for his pupil, make me but another syrinx for that piping. 28. With your head thrown backward in my arm's safe hollow, and your face all rosy with a mounting fervor, while the grave eyes greaten with a wise new wonder, swimming in a love mist like the haze of autumn. From that throat, the throbbing nightingales for pleading, wayward, soft, and welling inarticulate love notes, come the words that bubble up through broken laughter, sweeter than spring water. Gods, I am so happy. 29. Ah, what am I but a torrent, headstrong, impetuous, broken, like the spent clamor of waters in the blue canyon? 
Ah, uh, what art thou but a fern frond, wet with blown spray from the river, diffident, lovely, sequestered, frail on the rock ledge? Yet are we not for one brief day, while the sun sleeps in the mountain, wild-hearted lover and loved one, safe in Pan's keeping? 30. Love shakes my soul, like a mountain wind falling upon the trees, when they are swayed and whitened and bowed as the great gusts will. I know why Daphne sped through the grove when the bright god came by, and shut herself in the laurel's heart for her silent doom. Love fills my heart, like my lover's breath filling the hollow flute, till the magic wood awakes and cries with remembrance and joy. Ah, timid syrinx, do I not know thy tremor of sweet fear? For a beautiful and imperious player is the lord of life. End of section 4「Section 5 of Sappho, 100 Lyrics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Sappho, 100 Lyrics by Bliss Carmen. 31. Love, let the wind cry on the dark mountain bending the ash trees and the tall hemlocks with the great voice of thunderous legions how i adore thee let the hoarse torrent in the blue canyon murmuring mightily out of the gray mist of primal chaos cease not proclaiming how i adore thee let the long rhythm of crunching rollers breaking and bellowing on the white seaboard tighten and tireless tell why the world stands how i adore thee love let the clear call of the tree cricket frailest of creatures green as the young grass mark with his trilling resonant bell note how i adore thee let the glad lark song over the meadow that melting lyric of molten silver be for a signal to listening mortals how i adore thee but more than all sounds sure serener fuller with passion and exultation let the hushed whisper in thine own heart say how i adore thee thirty two i would build a fragrant temple to thee in the dark green forest of red cedar and fine sandal and there love thee with sweet service all my whole life long i would freshen it with flowers and the piney hill wind through it should be sweetened with soft fervors of small prayers in gentle language thou wouldst smile to hear and a tinkling eastern wind bell with its fluttering inscription from the rafters with bronze music should retard the quiet fleeting of uncounted hours and my hero while so human should be even as the gods are in that shrine of utter gladness with the tranquil stars above it and the sea below thirty three never yet love in earth's lifetime hath any cunningest minstrel told the one-seventh of wisdom ravishment ecstasy transport hid in the hue of the hyacinths purple in springtime not in the lyre of orpheus not in the songs of musaeus lurked the unfathomed bewitchment wrought by the wind in the grasses held by the root of the sea surf in early summer only to exquisite lovers fashion for beauty's fulfillment made it as rhythm to reed stop whence the wild music is moulded ever appears the full measure of the world's wonder thirty four who was athos 
men shall ask when the world is old and time has accomplished without haste the strange destiny of men haply in that far-off age one shall find these silver songs with their human freight and guess what a lover sappho was thirty five when the great pink mallow blossoms in the marshland full of lazy summer and soft hours then i hear the summons not a mortal lover ever yet resisted strange and far in the faint blue foothills making magic music pan is at his love work on the reeds i can guess the heart stop fall and lull and sequence full of grief for syrinx long ago then the crowding madness wild and keen and tender trembles with the burden of great joy nay but well i follow all unskilled that fluting never yet was reed nymph like to thee thirty six when i pass thy door at night i a benediction breathe ye who have the sleeping world in your care guard the linen sweet and cool where a lovely golden head with its dreams of mortal bliss slumbers now thirty seven well i found you in the twilight garden laid a lover's hand upon your shoulder and we both were made aware of loving past the reach of reason to unravel or the much desiring heart to follow there we heard the breath among the grasses and the gurgle of soft running water well contented with the spacious starlight the cool winds touch in the deep blue distance till the dawn came in with golden sandals thirty eight will not men remember us in the days to come hereafter thy warm-coloured loving beauty and my love for thee thou the hyacinth that grows by a quiet running river i the watery reflection and the broken gleam thirty nine i grow weary of the foreign cities the sea travel and the stranger peoples even the clear voice of hardy fortune dares me not as once on brave adventure for the heart of man must seek and wander ask and question and discover knowledge yet above all goodly things is wisdom and love greater than all understanding so a mariner i long for landfall when a darker purple on the sea rim or the prow uplifted shall be lesbos and the gleaming towers of mitylene forty ah what detains thee fan so long for mitylene where now thy restless lover wearies for thy coming a fever burns me fan my knees quake on the threshold and all my strength is loosened slack with disappointment but thou wilt come my fan back from the sea like morning to quench in golden gladness the ache of parted lovers end of section five section six of sappho one hundred lyrics by bliss carman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by peter yearsley forty one phaon o oh my lover what should so detain thee now the wind comes walking through the leafy twilight all the plum leaves quiver with the coolth and darkness after their long patience in consuming ardour and the moving grasses have relief the dew drench comes to quell the parching ache of noon they suffered i alone of all things fret with unsluiced fire and there is no quenching in the night for sappho 
since her lover Phaon leaves her unrequited. 42. O oh, heart of insatiable longing! What spell, what enchantment allures thee over the rim of the world with the sails of the sea-going ships? And when the rose petals are scattered at dead of still noon on the grass plot, what means this passionate grief, this infinite ache of regret? 43. Surely, somehow, in some measure, there will be joy and fulfilment. Cease from this throb of desire, even for Sappho. Surely, some fortunate hour, Phaon will come, and his beauty be spent like water to plenish need of that beauty. Where is the breath of Poseidon, cool from the sea floor with evening? Why are Selene's white horses so long arriving? 44. Oh, but my delicate lover, is she not fair as the moonlight? Is she not supple and strong for hurried passion? Has not the god of the green world in his large tolerant wisdom filled with the ardours of earth her twenty summers? Well did he make her for loving, well did he mould her for beauty, gave her the wish that is brave with understanding. O oh, Pan, avert from this maiden sorrow, misfortune, bereavement, harm, and unhappy regret. Praise one fond mortal. 45. Softer than the hill-fog to the forest are the loving hands of my dear lover when she sleeps beside me in the starlight and her beauty drenches me with rest. As the quiet mist enfolds the beech-trees, even as she dreams, her arms enfold me half awaking with a hundred kisses on the scarlet lily of her mouth. 46. I seek and desire even as the wind that travels the plain and stirs in the bloom of the apple tree. I wander through life with the searching mind that is never at rest till I reach the shade of my lover's door. 47. Like torn sea kelp in the drift of the great tides of the sea, carried past the harbour mouth to the deep beyond, return. I am buoyed and borne away on the loveliness of earth, little caring save for thee past the portals of the night. 48. Fine woven purple linen I bring thee from Phocea, that beauty upon beauty a precious gift may cover the lap where I have lain, and a gold comb and girdle and trinkets of white silver and gems are in my sea-chest, lest, poor and empty-handed, thy lover should return. And I have brought from Tyre a pan-flute stained vermilion, wherein the gods have hidden love and desire and longing which I shall loose for thee. 49. When I am home from travel, my eager foot will stay not until I reach the threshold where I went forth from thee. And there, as darkness gathers in the rose-scented garden, the God who prospers music shall give me skill to play. And thou shalt hear, all startled, a flute blown in the twilight, with the soft pleading magic the greenwood heard of old. Then, lamp in hand, thy beauty in the rose-marble entry, and unreluctant Hermes shall give me words to say. 50. When I behold the pharos shine and lay a path along the sea, how gladly I shall feel the spray, standing upon the swinging prow, and question of my pilot old, how many watery leagues to sail, ere we shall round the harbour reef, and anchor off the wharves of home. End of section 6
Section 7 of Sappho, 100 Lyrics by Bliss Carman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Five Pack. 51. Is the day long, O lesbian maiden, and the night endless in thy lone chamber in Mytilene? All the bright day, until welcome evening, when the stars kindle over the harbor, what tasks employ thee? Passing the fountain at golden sundown, one of the home-going traffickers, hast thou thought of thy lover? Nay, but how far, too brief will the night be, when I returning to the dear portal, hear my own heart beat. 52. Lo, on the distance a dark blue ravine, a fold in the mountainous forests of fir, cleft from the skyline sheer down to the shore. Above are the clouds and the white peeling gulls, at its foot is the rough broken foam of the sea, with ever anon the long deep muffled roar, a sigh from the fitful great heart of the world. Then inland, just where the small meadow begins, well bulwarked with boulders that jut in the tide, lies safe beyond storm beat the harbor in sun. See where the black fishing boats, each at its buoy, ride up on the swell with their dare danger prows to sight o'er the sea rim what venture may come. And look where the narrow white streets of the town leap up with the blue water's edge to the wood, scant room for man's range between mountain and sea, and the market where woodsmen from over the hill may traffic, and sailors from far foreign ports with treasure brought in from the ends of the earth, and see the third house on the left, with that gleam of red burnished copper, the hinge of the door, where I shall enter, expect it so oft, let love be your sea star, to voyage no more. 53. Art thou the topmost apple, the gatherers could not reach, reddening on the bough, shall not I take thee? Art thou a hyacinth blossom, the shepherds upon the hills have trodden into the ground, shall not I lift thee? Free is the young god Eros, paying no tribute to power, seeing no evil in beauty, full of compassion. Once having found the beloved, however sorry or woeful, however scornful of loving, little it matters. 54. How soon will all my lovely days be over, and I no more be found beneath the sun, neither beside the many murmuring sea, nor where the plain winds whisper to the reeds, nor in the tall beech woods among the hills, where roam the bright lipped oreads, nor along the pasture sides where berry pickers stray, and harmless shepherds pipe their sheep to fold. For I am eager, and the flame of life burns quickly in the fragile lamp of clay. Passion and love and longing and hot tears consume this mortal Sappho, and too soon a great wind from the dark will blow upon me, and I be no more found in the fair world for all the search of the revolving moon and patient shine of the everlasting stars. 55. Soul of sorrow, why this weeping? What immortal grief have touched thee with the poignancy of sadness, testament of tears? Have the high gods deigned to show thee destiny and disillusion, fills thy heart at all things human, fleeting and desired? Nay, the gods themselves are fettered by one law which links together truth and nobleness and beauty, man and stars and sea, and they only shall find freedom, who with courage rise and follow, where love leads beyond all peril, wise beyond all words. 56. It never can be mine to sit in the door in the sun and watch the world go by, a pageant and a dream. For I was born for love and fashioned for desire, beauty, passion, and joy, and sorrow and unrest, and with all things of earth eternally must go, daring the perilous born of joyance and of death, a strain of song by night, a shadow on the hill, a hint of odorous grass, a murmur of the sea. 57. Others shall behold the sun through the long uncounted years, not a maid in after time wise as thou. For the gods have given thee their best gift and equal mind that can only love, be glad, and fear not. 58. Let thy strong spirit never fear, nor in thy virgin soul be thou afraid. The gods themselves and the almightier fates cannot avail to harm, with outward and misfortunate chance, the radiant unshaken mind of him who at his being's center will abide, secure from doubt and fear. His wise and patient heart shall share the strong, sweet loveliness of all things made, and the serenity of inward joy, beyond the storm of tears. 59. 
will none say of sappho speaking of her lovers and the love they gave her joy and days and beauty flute playing and roses song and wine and laughter will none musing murmur yet for all the roses all the flutes and lovers doubt not she was lonely as the sea whose cadence haunts the world for ever sixty when i have departed say but this behind me love was all her wisdom all her care well she kept love's secret dared and never faltered laughed and never doubted love would win let the world's rough triumph trample by above her she is safe forever from all harm in a land that knows not bitterness nor sorrow she has found out all of truth at last end of section seven section eight of sappho one hundred lyrics by bliss carman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by five pack sixty one there is no more to say now thou art still there is no more to do now thou art dead there is no more to know now thy clear mind is back returned unto the gods who gave it now thou art gone the use of life is past the meaning and the glory and the pride there is no joyous friend to share the day and on the threshold no awaited shadow sixty two play up play up thy silver flute the crickets all are brave glad is the red autumnal earth and the blue sea play up thy flawless silver flute dead ripe are fruit and grain when love puts on his scarlet coat put off thy care sixty three a beautiful child is mine formed like a golden flower cleis the loved one and above her i value not all the lydian land nor lovely hellas sixty four ah but now henceforth only one meaning has life for me only one purport measure and beauty has the bright world what mean the woodwinds colour and morning bird stream and hill and the brave city with its enchantment thee only thee sixty five softly the wind moves through the radiant morning and the warm sunlight sinks into the valley filling the green earth with the quiet joyance strength and fulfilment even so gentle strong and wise and happy through the soul and substance of my being comes the breath of thy great love to me word o thou dear mortal sixty six what the west wind whispers at the end of summer when the barley harvest ripens to the sickle who can tell what means the fine music of the dry cicada through the long noon hours of the autumn stillness who can say how the grape ungathered with its bloom of blueness greatens on the trellis of the brick-walled garden who can know yet i too am greatened keep the notes of gladness travel by the wind's road through this autumn leisure by thy love sixty seven indoors the fire is kindled Beechwood is piled on the hearthstone, cold are the chattering oak leaves, and the ponds frost bitten. Softer than rainfall at twilight, bringing the fields benediction, and the hills quiet in grayness, are my long thoughts of thee. How should thy friend fear the seasons? They only perish of winter, whom love audacious and tender never hath visited. 68. You ask how love can keep the mortal soul, strong to the pitch of joy throughout the years ask how your brave cicada on the bough keeps the long sweet insistence of his cry ask how the pleiads steer across the night in their serene unswerving mighty course ask how the wood flowers waken to the sun unsummoned save by some mysterious word ask how the wandering swallows find your eaves upon the rain wind with returning spring ask who commands the ever punctual tide to keep the pendulous rhythm of the sea and you shall know what leads to the heart of man to the far haven of his hopes and fears sixty nine like a tall forest were their spears their banners like a silken sea when the great host in splendor passed across the crimson sinking sun and then the bray of brazen horns arose above their clanking march as the long waving column filed into the odorous purple dusk o oh, lover in this radiant world whence is the race of mortal men so frail so mighty and so fond that fleets into the vast unknown seventy my lover smiled o friend ask not 
the journey's end nor whence we are that whistling boy who minds his goats so idly in the gray ravine the brown-backed rower drenched with spray the lemon seller in the street and the young girl who keeps her first wild love tryst at the rising moon lo these are wiser than the wise and not for all our questioning shall we discover more than joy nor find a better thing than love let pass the banners and the spears the hate the battle and the greed for greater than all gifts is peace and strength is in the tranquil mind end of section eight section nine of sappho one hundred lyrics by bliss carman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by five pack seventy one ye who have the stable world in the keeping of your hands flocks and men the lasting hills and the ever-wheeling stars ye who freight with wondrous things the wide wandering heart of man and the galleon of the moon on those silent seas of foam oh if ever ye shall grant time and place and room enough to this fond and fragile heart stifled with the throb of love on that day one grave-eyed fate pausing in her toil shall say lo one mortal has achieved immortality of love seventy two i heard the gods reply trust not the future with its perilous chance the fortunate hour is on the dial now to-day be wise and great and put off hesitation and go forth with cheerful courage for the diurnal need stout be the heart nor slow the foot to follow the impetuous will nor the hand slack upon the loom of deeds then may the fates look up and smile a little in their tolerant way being full of infant regard for men seventy three the sun on the tide the peach on the bough the blue smoke over the hill and the shadows trailing the valley side make up the autumn day ah no not half thou art not here under the bronze beech leaves and thy lover's soul with a lonely child roams through an empty room seventy four if death be good why do the gods not die if life be ill why do the gods live if love be not why do the gods still love if love be all what should men do but love seventy five tell me what this life means o oh, my prince and lover with the autumn sunlight on thy bronze gold head with thy clear voice sounding through the silver twilight what is the lost secret of the tacit earth seventy six ye have heard how marsyas in the folly of his pride boasted of a matchless skill when the great god's back was turned how his fond imagining fell to ashes cold and gray when the flawless player came in serenity and light so it was with those i loved in the years ere i loved thee many a saying sounds like truth until truth itself is heard many a beauty only lives until beauty passes by and the mortal is forgot in the shadow of the god seventy seven hour by hour i sit watching the silent door shadows go by on the wall and steps in the street expectation and doubt flutter my timorous heart so many hurrying home and thou still away seventy eight once in the shining street in the heart of a seaborne town as i waited behold there came the woman i loved as when in the early spring a daffodil blooms in the grass golden and gracious and glad the solitude smiled seventy nine how strange is love o oh my lover with what enchantment and power does it not come upon mortals learned or heedless how far away and unreal faint as blue isles in a sunset haze golden all else of life seems since i have known thee eighty how to say i love you what if i but live it were the use in that love small indeed only every moment of this waking lifetime let me be your lover and your friend ah but then as sure as blossom breaks from bud sheath when along the hillside spring returns golden speech should flower from the soul so cherished and the mouth your kisses filled with fire End of section 9section ten of sappho one hundred lyrics by bliss carman 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. 81. Hark, love, to the tambourines of the minstrels in the street, and one voice that throbs and soars clear above the clashing time. Some Egyptian royal love lilt, some Sidonian refrain, vows of Paphos or of Tyre, mount against the silver sun, pleading, piercing yet serene, vagrant in a foreign town. From what passion was it born, in what lost land over sea? 82. Over the roofs, the honey-coloured moon with purple shadows on the silver grass, and the warm south wind on the curving sea, while we two, lovers, passed all turmoil now. Watch from the window the white sails come in, bearing what unknown ventures safe to port. So falls the hour of twilight and of love, with wizardry to loose the hearts of men, and there is nothing more in this great world than thou and I, and the blue dome of dusk. 83. In the quiet garden world, gold sunlight and shadow leaves flicker on the wall, and the wind, a moment since, with rose petals strewed the path and the open door. Now the moon-white butterflies float across the liquid air, glad as in a dream, and across thy lover's heart visions of one scarlet mouth with its maddening smile. 84. Soft was the wind in the beech trees, low was the surf on the shore. In the blue dusk one planet, like a great sea pharos, shone. But nothing to me were the sea sounds, the wind, and the yellow star when over my breast the banner of your golden hair was spread. 85. Have you heard the news of Sappho's garden, and the golden rose of Mytilene, which the bending brown-armed rowers lately brought from oversea, from lonely Pontus? In a meadow by the river Halys, where some wood-god hath the world in keeping, on a burning summer noon they found her, lovely as a dryad, and more tender. Her these eyes have seen, and not another shall behold, till time takes all things goodly, so surpassing fair, and fond, and wondrous, such a slave, as worth a great king's ransom, no man yet of all the sons of mortals but would lose his soul for, and regret not. So hath beauty compassed all her children with the cords of longing and desire. Only Hermes, master of word music, ever yet in glory of gold language, could ensphere the magical remembrance of her melting, half-sad, wayward beauty or devise the silver phrase to frame her, the inevitable name to call her, half a sigh and half a kiss when whispered, like pure air that feeds a forge's hunger. Not a painter in the isles of Hellas could portray her, mix the golden tawny with bright stain of poppies, or in sanguine like the life her darling mouth's vermilion, so that in the ages long hereafter, when we shall be dust of perished summers, any man could say, who found that likeness, smiling gently on it, this was Gorgo. 86. Love is so strong a thing, the very gods must yield, when it is welded fast with the unflinching truth. Love is so frail a thing, a word, a look, will kill. O oh, lovers, have a care how ye do deal with love. 87. Hadst thou with all thy loveliness been true, had I with all my tenderness been strong, 
we had not made this ruin out of life this desolation in a world of joy my poor gorgo yet even the high gods at times do err be therefore thou not overcome with woe but dedicate anew to greater love an equal heart and be thy radiant self once more gorgo eighty eight as on a morn a traveller might emerge from the deep green seclusion of the hills by a cool road through forest and through fern little frequented winding followed long with joyous expectation and daydreams and on a sudden turning a great rock covered with frondage dark with dripping water behold the seaboard full of surf and sound with all the space and glory of the world above the burnished silver of the sea even so it was upon that first spring day when time that is a devious path for men led me all lonely to thy door at last and all thy splendid beauty gracious and glad glad as bright colour free as wind or air and lovelier than racing seas of foam bore sense and soul and mind at once away to a pure region where the gods might dwell making of me a vagrant child before a servant of joy at aphrodite's will eighty nine where shall i look for thee where find thee now o oh, my lost atis storm bars the harbour and snow keeps the pass in the blue mountains bitter the wind whistles pale is the sun and the days shorten close to the hearthstone with long thoughts of thee thy lonely lover sits now remembering all the spent hours and thy fair beauty ah when the hyacinth wakens with spring and buds the laurel doubt not some morning when all earth revives hearing pan's flute call over the river beds over the hills sounding the summons i shall look up and behold in the door smiling expectant loving as ever and glad as of old my own lost athis ninety a sad sad face and saddest eyes that ever beheld the sun whence came the grief that makes of all thy beauty one sad sweet smile in this bright portrait where the painter fixed them i still behold the eyes that gladdened and the lips that loved me and gold on rose the cloud of hair that settles on one shoulder slipped from its vest i almost hear thy mytilenean love-song in the spring night when the still air was odorous with blossoms and in the hour thy first wild girl's love trembled into being glad glad and fond ah where is all that wonder what god's malice undid that joy and set the seal of patient woe upon thee o oh, my lost love the end of section 10section 11 of sappho 100 lyrics by bliss carman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by peter yearsley 91 why have the gods in derision severed us heart of my being where have they lured thee to wander o oh, my lost lover while now i sojourn with sorrow having remorse for my comrade what town is blessed with thy beauty gladdened and prospered nay who could love as i loved thee with whom thy beauty was mingled in those spring days when the swallows came with the south wind then i became as that shepherd loved by selene on latmus once when her own summer magic took hold upon her 
with a sweet madness and thenceforth her mortal lover must wander over the wide world for ever like one enchanted ninety two like a red lily in the meadow grasses swayed by the wind and burning in the sunlight i saw you where the city chokes with traffic bearing among the passers-by your beauty unsullied wild and delicate as a flower and then i knew past doubt or peradventure our loved and mighty eleusinian mother had taken thought of me for her pure worship and of her favour had assigned my comrade for the great mysteries knew i should find you when the dusk murmured with its new-made lovers and we be no more foolish but wise children and well content partake of joy together as she ordains and human hearts desire ninety three when in the spring the swallows all return and the bleak bitter sea grows mild once more with all its thunders softened to a sigh when to the meadows the young green comes back and swelling buds put forth on every bough with wild wood odours on the delicate air ah then in that so lovely earth wilt thou with all thy beauty love me all one way and make me all thy lover as before lo where the white-maned horses of the surge plunging in thunderous onset to the shore trample and break and charge along the sand ninety four cold is the wind where daphne sleeps that was so tender and so warm with loving with a loveliness than her own laurel lovelier now pipes the bitter wind for her and the snow sifts about her door while far below her frosty hill the racing billows plunge and boom ninety five hark where poseidon's white racing horses trample with tumult the shelving seaboard older than saturn older than rhea that mournful music falling and surging with the vast rhythm ceaseless eternal keeps the long tally of all things mortal how many lovers hath not its lulling cradled to slumber with the ripe flowers ere for our pleasure this golden summer walked through the cornlands in gracious splendour how many loved ones will it not croon to in the long spring days through coming ages when all our daydreams have been forgotten and none remembers even thy beauty they too shall slumber in quiet places and mighty sea sounds call them unheeded ninety six hark my lover it is spring on the wind a faint far call wakes a pang within my heart unmistakable and keen at the harbour mouth a sail glimmers in the morning sun and the ripples at her prow whiten into crumbling foam as she forges outward bound for the teeming foreign ports through the open window now hear the sailors lift a song in the meadow ground the frogs with their deafening flutes begin the old madness of the world in their golden throats again little fifers of live bronze who hath taught you with wise lore to unloose the strains of joy when orion seeks the west and you feathered flute players who instructed you to fill all the blossomy orchards now with melodious desire i doubt not our father pan hath a care of all these things in some valley of the hills far away and misty blue by quick water he hath cut a new pipe and set the wood to his smiling lips and blown that earth's rapture be restored and those wild pandian stops mark the cadence life must keep 
O oh, my lover, be thou glad, it is spring in Hellas now. 97. When the early soft spring wind comes blowing over Rhodes and Samos and Miletus, from the seven mouths of Nile to Lesbos, freighted with sea odours and gold sunshine, what news spreads among the island people in the market-place of Mytilene, lending that unwonted stir of gladness to the busy streets and thronging doorways? Is it word from Ninus or Arbilla, Babylon the Great or Northern Imbrose? Have the laden galleons been sighted stoutly labouring up the sea from Tyre? Nay, tis older news that foreign sailor with the cheek of sea tan stops to prattle to the young fixella with her basket and the breasts that bud beneath her tunic and i hear it in the rustling tree-tops all this passionate bright tender body quivers like a leaf the wind has shaken now love wanders through the aisles of springtime ninety eight i am more tremulous than shaken reeds and love has made me like the river water thy voice is as the hill wind over me and all my changing heart gives heed my lover before thy least lost murmur i must sigh or gladden with thee as the sun path glitters ninety nine over the wheat field over the hill crest swoop and is gone the beat of a wild wing brushing the pine tops bending the poppies hurrying northward with golden summer what premonition o oh purple swallow told thee the happy hour of migration hark on the threshold hush flurried heart in me was there a footfall did no one enter soon will a shepherd in rugged dacia folding his gentle ewes in the twilight lifting a level gaze from the sheepfold say to his fellows lo it is springtime this very hour in mitellini will not a young girl say to her lover lifting her moon-white arms to enlace him ere the glad sigh comes lo it is love time one hundred once more the rain on the mountain once more the wind in the valley with the soft odours of springtime and the long breath of remembrance o oh, litia sees warm is the sun in the city on the street corners with laughter traffic the flower girls beauty blossoms once more for thy pleasure in many places gentlier now falls the twilight with the slim moon in the pear trees and the green frogs in the meadows blow on shrill pipes to awaken the litierses gladlier now crimson morning flushes fair-built mitellini portico temple and column where the young garlanded women praise thee with singing ah but what burden of sorrow tinges their slow stately chorus though spring revisits the glad earth wilt thou not wake to their summons o litiuses shall they then never behold thee never more see thee returning down the blue cleft of the mountains nor in the purple of evening welcome thy coming never more answer thy glowing youth with their ardour nor cherish with lovely longing thy spirit nor with soft laughter beguile thee o litiuses heedless assuaged art thou sleeping where the spring sun cannot find thee nor the wind waken nor woodlands bloom for thy innocent rapture through golden hours hast thou no passion nor pity for thy deserted companions never again will thy beauty quell their desire nor rekindle o litiuses nay but in vain their clear voices call thee thy sensitive beauty is become part of the fleeting loveliness merged in the pathos of all things mortal in the faint fragrance of flowers 
on the sweet draught of the sea wind linger strange hints now that loosen tears for thy gay gentle spirit o lityerses end of section 11